Happy Halloween, everybody. So obviously, I am dressed as a struggling YouTuber, and I wouldn't want anything less because that is the most scary thing this Halloween. I went to the 99 cent store. I got myself some 99 cent props, which probably looks like they're worth 99 cents. I have two true crime Halloween stories for you guys. And if you guys have never heard these ones, just like me, then you're about to be shocked, okay? The first one being as demented as they come, and the second one pretty much being as stupid as they come. So stick around for that. So, our first story today comes out of Oak Harbor, Ohio on Halloween of 2010. Now, we have 16-year-old Devin Griffin and his brother, 23-year-old Derek, and they come from a fractured family. Their mother had divorced their father and uh, remarried a man named William Lisk. Now, the boys kept everything civil, you know, enough, but they did yearn for better days. They yearned to go back to the way it was, especially young Devin. They also had to get along with a new stepbrother that they didn't care much about, and his name was BJ Lisk. Now, on the day just before Halloween, 16-year-old Devin, he missed his real father so he went on over to his dad's house and they hung out they had dinner they had great conversations together a conversation about the matters of life or whatnot his dad was you know being a father figure this would last deep into the night even though both of them knew that Devin had church choir early in the morning and that they lost track of time and so they figured hey you know what Devin it's late, just sleep over, and that's exactly what they did. They called Susan to let her know, and Devin spent the night. Early in the morning, both would pop out of bed because they have to rush now. But instead of rushing to the church, they instead turned this way and went to the Lisk house. So the car is now parked in front of the Lisk household. Devin jumps out and leaves his father waiting in the idling car and it would just take a few moments before Devin would re-emerge running out and he was completely startled when he saw his stepbrother BJ in the driveway. It caught him off guard, He waved at BJ and said, hey I'll be home later on. Devin runs to the car, gets in and drives off with his father. And BJ is just left there in the driveway with such an odd feeling about what he had just seen. But he lets it go, gets in the truck, and leaves. Now, Devin would go on to play his church choir as his father watched proudly. And afterwards, his father would drop Devin off back at the Lisk house. Devin lets himself in, runs straight to his room, turns on his game system, and just spends the next few hours playing video games. Later that day, the police would be called by some frantic woman and she says they need to get over to the Lisk household immediately. There has been murders. And when the dispatch hears that, they're dispatching everybody. Shortly, the property was overrun by police cars, detectives, forensics, you name it. They were there because within the walls of this house, every occupant murdered. 53-year-old William Lisk and his wife, 46-year-old Susan Lisk, were found shot to death in their beds. 23-year-old Derek Griffin was found bludgeoned to death in a downstairs bedroom. Now, when police first arrived, they would find the most gruesome thing that they have ever seen in their lives, in their careers, when they found the bodies of William and Susan. William had been shot five times at point blank range, and Susan was shot three times, and it was clear to them that she was shot second because William had no defensive wounds. He was probably murdered with the first bullet to the head. Whereas Susan, she would be awakened by these gunshots, puts her hands up where they could see their bullets went through her hands. Derek Griffin's body was found later bludgeoned to death by some blunt object that the detectives believed was a hammer. Now, because of the difference in how the people were murdered in this case, they figured that Derek was murdered first because the way he was murdered, 
didn't make a lot of noise and then slowly creeps on over to the upstairs bedroom where he knew susan and william would be sleeping leading detectives to believe that whoever committed this crime knew how this household worked already knew exactly where everybody was going to be on a sunday morning now detectives found that there was a pond in the back of this residence and they found a couple of footprints leading up to the dock and so they figured okay the killer came back here probably chucked the gun into this pond so they ordered to have it drained now the funny thing was they actually found that bloody hammer it was hidden away in some random closet so why didn't the killer just go ahead and throw this hammer into the pond as well well that pond would be drained and no gun was found the neighbor would give an important statement which gave a potential time frame for these killings because they most likely occurred at 6 30 in the morning because she was startled by what she described as loud banging noises and now that she knows what happened to her neighbors she's pretty sure she heard the gunshots now of course their eyes would now lock in on 16 year old devin griffin let's see what his story is he says that on that morning when he jumped into the car with his father they were in crunch time because in order to get him to church choir he had to go ahead and get his church gear all his choir gear was back at home so they parked in front of the list household Devin ran into the house and he quickly grabbed his gear and rushed back to his father's car then he said something that really raised a few eyebrows he said that he was running out of the house and he was surprised to see bj out in the driveway now why that was because william lisk his biological father by the way had kicked him out of the house not too long ago now devon continued that after church choir he got home ran upstairs immediately to put his gear away saw his game box and just started playing with it and that it would be a while before it occurred to Devin how quiet it was for a Sunday. He figured that his mother would have come up and yanked the controller out of his hand by now, but it never happened. He got up and he went to his parents' room and he saw what he thought were two dummies laying in his parents' bed. Dummies, like mannequins. Not, <laughs> not stupid people. And in his own words, he thought this was a prank a hoax by his parents to scare him it was halloween and they knew how he appreciated a good prank but then he looked again he saw the blood splatter all over the walls were they really going all out for this and as he got closer he realized that his mother and his stepfather were laying in that blood soaked bed riddled with bullets now Devin went cold yeah, his mind, it froze. And instead of calling 911, the only thing he could think about was calling his aunt, Susan's sister. She would be the one that would actually call it in. Now, once alibis were confirmed, Devin and his father were eventually cleared. And the next logical step would be, so where is this BJ? Just know, BJ is only what everybody calls him. His name is actually William, just like his father, and I don't know why, but everybody calls him BJ. Now, it would be Devin's aunt, the same lady that called it in, that would fill detectives in on a bit of disturbing family history concerning BJ and her late sister, Susan. There was tension from the very first day they met because BJ was very similar to Devin and he craved for things to go back to the way they were. You know, things kids think about that come from a broken home. So since that very first day, things never got better. It only got worse and it was exacerbated when his father married Susan in 2001. Now, considering BJ's unacceptable behavior, Susan felt that she was forced to establish some ground rules in the house, but bj was having none of it in fact his behavior only got worse he began skipping school and doing lord knows what so by 2002 
just a year into the marriage, local authorities were very familiar with BJ, who was now just 16 years old. He was already put on house arrest for numerous offenses, and when the police first came to arrest him, they ended up being attacked by the boy, which ended up adding assault charges in juvenile court. Now, in 2004, a now 18-year-old BJ punched Susan straight in the chest during an argument. Now, after a couple of horrifying months of madness, Susan finally filed assault charges when BJ just straight smacked her upside the head with a coffee cup and then stole her car. And get this, the assault and robbery charges were dropped because he was deemed incompetent to stand trial. Now, we clearly see why Devin and Derek never got along with their stepbrother. Family members would state that BJ had some obvious mental illness. He was already extremely confrontational and now he was adding alcohol to the fire and he would become a complete nightmare to be around. William Lisk, his father, tried his best to mitigate this bad blood but he himself finally ran out of patience with his own biological son. He took his wife's side, rightly so, and kicked BJ out of the house. Well, to detectives, if that didn't sound like a motive, then nothing does. And of course the question, well, where in the world is BJ now? And it turns out that that question wasn't actually hard, it was just a very far drive. Now, he was kicked out of the house with just probably a suitcase, but no place to go. So the only other place that family members could think of him going to was a family hunting cabin in Carroll County, which was roughly 170 miles away. Well, they would find BJ in that cabin, and considering his past history with them, they 100% expected a fight from this man, but fortunately, he was apprehended without any incident. And guess what they found on his clothes? They had Susan's, Williams, and Derek's DNA. As if he wasn't really looking to get away with this crime at all. He was just looking to buy himself a little time. Now, they would find a rifle in William Liss's white truck, matching the same 22 caliber used in the murder. That's apparently what he was loading into the truck when he was caught off guard by Devin running out of the house that morning. And you gotta imagine what the fuck was going through BJ's mind when he saw his little stepbrother running outside of a house, a house in which he had just murdered their entire family in. So BJ would wind up confessing to his biological mother on the prison phone that he committed the murders and that he was not in his right mind. But besides all that, there was plenty of evidence and he would receive three life sentences, though he would end up committing suicide in his prison cell in 2015. Now let's go ahead and get into the second story, but first I'd like to say, hey, please hit the like button if you guys are enjoying yourself so far besides comments. It's kind of the only way that I know that you guys like my stuff. Well, on a chilling night of Halloween of 2011, for one unfortunate soul, things would take a nightmarish turn. A woman, now lifeless, lay sprawled face down in a pool of her own blood, and the night started off so well for her. She was having an evening of, I guess you can say, primal desires with her man. And afterwards, they were just lounging around, enjoying some Halloween candy together. Now, the absurdity of why she lost her life really goes to show, no matter how long you've known, no matter how much you think you know someone, what darkness can lie just beneath the surface of their minds. So this is a story that I came across as I was looking through Halloween stories and I never heard of it before and I wasn't ready to believe this source that I was listening to until I actually found the court documents for this actual case and I sourced it in the description below so if at any point in this video that you go, oh, come on, man, is this one of your creepy pasta fictions? Go to the description, click the links, and hey, I accept your apology ahead of time. 
but let's go ahead and start this story. Now, it's no mystery that Chicago has gained a reputation as being one of the most violent cities in the United States. When you fully earn a nickname like Chirac, then you know there's a problem. Stretching as far back as the 1920s, names like Al Capone ran the streets and violent crimes would increase steadily throughout the decades. Now, in 2016, Chicago single-handedly claimed half of all of the United States' increase in homicides that year. Now, there's a strong gang culture and corruption going as far up as politicians. People are getting killed over territory, drugs, retaliation, the usual suspects, and of course, money. And on Halloween night of 2011, at a residential house in Chicago, Illinois, we could add candy to the list. And I'm not talking about the nose kind of candy. I'm just talking about Halloween candy. 55-year-old Liddell Peoples was in his house with 49-year-old Maria Adams, and they're both enjoying each other's company. Like I told you before, they had just done some hanky panky and are now sitting on the couch just enjoying a bag of Halloween candy. Now, it's a little hard to say if they were actually an exclusive couple, being that she was a sex worker, a prostitute, if you will, by trade. And the fact that Liddell has still been paying her for her services for the past four years at this point. And to know somebody that long in that intimate way, you could say you catch feelings, okay? So Liddell admittedly had feelings for Maria. He has admitted to her countless times that he was in love with her. And Maria, in her gratitude, I'm pretty sure added some bonus features to the DVD. Now, it's not truly known if Maria felt the same way or she was just stringing him along because he was her best customer, but she's no longer here to give her sigh. So back to the story, Liddell and Maria are just chilling, eating this candy. As they were about to call it a night, Liddell realized that the bag of candy that they were eating was gone. Now, he's a grown-ass man, so he didn't believe in magic, so he accuses Maria of stealing it. Well, this didn't sit well with Maria, who vehemently denies taking the bag, but Liddell knows that Maria is bullshitting him, and he forcibly searches her pockets as she curses the day he was born. And, of course, she's gonna try to leave the house, but he holds her back, and he continues searching, and lo and behold, in one of her jacket pockets was his big bag of candy. So from here, the situation escalates as Maria now really wants to get the fuck out of this house, but she can't overpower Liddell who is keeping her from doing so. Instead, she breaks free of him and runs to the kitchen. She grabs plates after plates and starts flinging them at Liddell. And these are some high velocity flings because one cracks them just above the right eye, leaving this large, nasty, bloody gash. And when you look at the mugshot, you could still see it healing. And Maria was still just flinging plates until she just ran out. And according to Liddell, she grabs not one, but two knives and attacks him with it. Liddell, he's infuriated. He had just lost all his dishes and he has this nasty gash on his eye and possibly a sugar crash. So he grabs a knife himself to protect himself, of course. He is able to knock Maria down to the floor. He wrestles away her knives and he begins to stab her until she stops moving. Now, when Liddell finally gets off her, Maria with her last bit of strength rolls over and lays face down in a pool of her own blood. Now, any rational person would see a scene like this and think that the person is dead. And Liddell, he admits that he did ponder escape, but he was 55 years old at this point. He hadn't really taken care of himself too well, so he was tired. He calls the police on himself instead because as you will see from his point of view, it wasn't his fault. Police arrived to find Liddell Peoples on his front porch looking relatively normal and calm. An officer asked him, Hey bud, what's going on? And he responded, That crazy bitch, she threw a plate at my head. 
Was that racist? When the paramedics finally get there, they tended to Maria, who remarkably was actually still alive, but barely. Her blood pressure was dangerously low and her sluggish eye movements indicated that she probably had some type of head trauma. And sadly, she would later die at the hospital where they estimated that she was stabbed over 20 times with indication that her head was stomped on. So the police would go on to search Liddell's residence and they would find the bag of candy, but they would also find cocaine. So this motherfucker liked all types of candy, but it was the sweet and sour chocolatey goodness of regular ass Halloween candy that took this man over the edge on a day. They were just giving it away. Liddell, my man, just put on a mask, go out and trick or treat and just re up. The motive is nonsensical. The perpetrator is just stupid. And the clown show will continue in a court case titled People vs. Peoples. So when prosecutors asked him point blank if he had stomped on the victim's head, this clown Liddell responds, N -n Not actually. As far as you know, doing it? You know, I thought I had got her some, but it was just self-defense. He then goes on to say that he didn't know that Maria was injured that because of her hair and stuff, it covered everything? Your 20 stab wounds, her bleeding profusely, her turning over, moaning and dying, her hair covered all that? You sat on her chest and stabbed her over 20 times. Guys, this might be the point that you don't believe me anymore. Go ahead and click the link below, read the document yourself. It's all there. And the next part of his testimony most likely severed all ties with the jury as well as reality in itself. He said that after calling the police, he went back to check on Maria. How did he check? He nudged her with his foot to see if maybe she needed some help. Now, I'm guessing that Liddell is still not comprehending what that crazy red liquid is because in his own words he said that he was making sure she wasn't still trying to do something sneaky liddell what do you think maria was trying to do that was sneaky she was pretending to have been stabbed 20 times did she come to your house with a fake bag of blood so as to just let it pool around her and pretend to bleed to death Liddell Peoples was found guilty of the murder of Maria Adams and given 30 years in prison and he'll be out when he's 85 years old. Now, if that's not the dumbest Halloween crime, I, give me another one. My name is Monks. Join me every week for a new true crime video and I'm adding creepy pasta or original suspense fiction to the lineup. So please let me know if you enjoy them and have a fun and safe Halloween. Be sure to protect the ones you love and don't forget to love the ones that protect you.